uh, uh, I sent one uh, uh, transcript of actually various talks that I gave in various places. Uh, um, uh, and uh, I had a long list of people to thank. Uh, and uh, even then I probably forgot to thank some people. Uh, so many people have played a role in uh, my life, in my life, in every life, really, um, positively, uh, that it is impossible to uh, thank them all uh, in writing, um, uh, although I remember them all. Uh, uh, but especially in music, I think it is important to uh, uh, remember your teachers. Uh, uh, who may not all be alive either. In fact, uh, uh, many of my teachers uh, are no longer uh, in this world. Uh, but um, uh, since uh, a child, I was very fortunate in, in learning from uh, some very gifted people who were not only really technically uh, very good, but also spiritually uh, uh, very advanced, uh, uh, starting with my mother and my grandmother. Um, uh, so uh, I, I, I always feel very humble uh, when I have to uh, talk about music, uh, uh, especially what I want to do today is to uh, speak more directly about the connections between spirituality and music uh, in Tagore. Uh, uh, I should also mention that uh, if you are interested in this topic of spirituality more, uh, I will be giving another seminar. Uh, on the 18th of October, uh, on a Thursday, I think, uh, we have a series on religion and violence. Uh, and my um, uh, talk, I think the title is uh, Spirituality Contra Fetishism. Uh, subtitle is Values and Violence. Uh, so that will be a different take, but I'm sure uh, the name of Tagore and other people who have influenced me very deeply, uh, not just musically, but also spiritually, uh, uh, will <laughs> surface. Um, I, I, I think uh, uh, I asked Saraji about this, uh, this book, uh, Amartya Sen, uh, how many of you have heard, uh, heard his name? Uh, he is, <laughs> uh, professionally now I am an economist, I, I used to be other things before as Saraji told you. Uh, uh, and uh, Amartya Sen is a Nobel Prize winning economist. Uh, uh, he went to the same school uh, that was founded by Tagore which later became a university and still is a university. Uh, I was very fortunate uh, to give another concert there uh, about three, now it's about four years ago. <laughs> uh, and it's a very beautiful campus, although uh, uh, what was a village at one time during Tagore's lifetime has now grown into a more than a small town with the traffic jams and other annoyances. Uh, but still, uh, uh, it has that aspect that Tagore wanted to and uh, uh, created, uh, uh, namely an open-air setting for um, art and music. Uh, and uh, I was very happy to perform uh, uh, in the open space uh, there. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that's the way music really should be. But Sen was lucky. He is. Um, uh, uh, grandfather was a colleague of, of Tagore uh, and taught in Shanti Niketan, which is uh, literally translated uh, the home of peace. Um, uh, Tagore was a genuinely peace-loving person and, and really worked to create uh, beauty and peace. Uh, um, well, in a way you can say that uh, Peace is beautiful, and, and beauty is peace. Um, you know, there, we just use two words, uh, but uh, they uh, connect with the same set of things. Um, uh, and uh, uh, although Tagore, like me, uh, I mean Sen, like me, is an economist, uh, he uh, uh, has been deeply influenced uh, by Tagore and the environment of that place. Uh, so when he was uh, uh, asked to write something on the 50th anniversary of Indian independence. Uh, you may know that India was uh, uh, declared independent uh, from the English uh, in 1947. So that part actually America and India have in common. Both used to be uh, British, British colonies and both fought for uh, their freedom and finally succeeded in, in, in resting free uh, from colonialism. Um, so 1997 was uh, the 50th anniversary and this is when 
uh, he wrote this and maybe it's uh, worthwhile to read a few paragraphs from there to give you an introduction and and bring it up to date um, because uh, Sen, uh, as is typical of him, also poses very thoughtfully some questions. This uh, uh, particular essay is called Tagore and he's India. And I quote, Rabindranath Tagore, who died in 1941 at the age of 80, is a towering figure in the millennium-old literature of Bengal. Anyone who becomes familiar with this large and flourishing tradition will be impressed by the power of Tagore's presence in Bangladesh and in India. His poetry, as well as his novels, short stories, and essays are very widely read, and the songs he composed reverberate around the eastern part of India and throughout Bangladesh. In contrast, in the rest of the world, especially in Europe and America, the excitement that Tagore's writings created in the early years of the 20th century has largely vanished. The enthusiasm with which his work was once greeted was quite remarkable. Gitanjali, a selection of his poetry for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1913, was published in English translation in London in March of that year and had been reprinted ten times by November when the award was announced. But he is not much read now in the West and already by 1937, Graham Greene was able to say, as for Rabindranath Tagore, I cannot believe that anyone but Mr. Yeats can still take his poems very seriously. Yeats was a great Irish poet uh, uh, who won the Nobel Prize uh, um, uh, as well. Um, so here is the problem. The contrast between Tagore's commanding presence in Bengali literature and culture and his near total eclipse in the rest of the world is perhaps less interesting than the distinction between the view of Tagore as a deeply relevant and many-sided contemporary thinker in Bangladesh and India and his image in the West as a repetitive and remote spiritualist. Graham Greene had, in fact, gone on to explain that he associated Tagore with what Chesterton calls the bright, pebbly eyes of the theosophists. Certainly, an air of mysticism played some part in the selling of Rabindranath Tagore to the West by Yeats, Pound, and his other early champions. But uh, the problem uh, that uh, uh, he poses is uh, what really uh, can make uh, Tagore come alive, as it were, in the way that he is alive uh, in uh, India and, and Bangladesh and, and some other parts of the world. And I think part of the problem is that uh, uh, spirituality has become a cliché. And whenever something becomes a cliché, uh, it really loses that, uh, that aliveness, uh, that uh, uh, stamp of uh, being born uh, from genuine experience uh, in, in, in someone's soul. And um, artistic expression, of course, uh, uh, demands more than just uh, experience. It demands uh, something of a concrete form, uh, and uh, it is difficult uh, uh, to translate. Um, from one language to another, uh, as poetry is very difficult, probably the most difficult uh, thing to translate. Uh, uh, music for those who actually have uh, good musical intuition uh, and uh, uh, some training uh, is easier, I would say. Although there too, uh, for vocal music, there is always the problem of uh, translating the lyrics. And that, uh, that is very challenging, uh, uh, as I know, or as anyone who has tried to translate uh, any, anything in music. So I think uh, the best thing to do is to say a few words about uh, 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 Tagore the man and uh, uh, the spirit of, of Tagore and what uh, uh, came from him or from his spirit. Uh, he was born in 1861 as, as Sen mentions, he died in 1941. Uh, that's a long life of 80 years, uh, during most of which he actually was uh, uh, creative. Uh, he started uh, uh, writing uh, probably when he was uh, uh, almost a child, uh, uh, yeah, when he was eight or nine years old. Uh, he, his first published stuff uh, uh, that we can find uh, uh, is from the time he was 12 years old. 
So um, he was very precocious. Uh, uh, and he grew, I think. Uh, that is the most amazing thing uh, that one finds. Uh, uh, and uh, you can compare him with other um, uh, artists, for example, Beethoven uh, uh, in the West, uh, who grew continuously, uh, of course, uh, uh, amidst much spiritual suffering and, and hardship. Um, uh, Tagore's life was, uh, from the outside, uh, not uh, uh, full of economic hardship, although his, uh, uh, he came from a landed family, and at that time, uh, uh, landed families were suffering decline uh, as capitalism was taking root, although under colonialism, uh, in a few parts of the economy, uh, a new class was rising, uh, and uh, the old aristocratic uh, uh, landowning class uh, was declining. Uh, Tagore really wasn't uh, very much into uh, uh, holding property or, or doing business. Uh, uh, he knew that there was a role for uh, uh, economic uh, matters in life because people have to, after all, make a living. Uh, and he was genuinely interested in uh, agricultural improvement, uh, rural development, we will call it today. Uh, and it might interest you to know that uh, he was uh, the first uh, uh, innovator in the world of microfinance. Uh, uh, he started it with his own money uh, in today's uh, Bangladesh, in the north uh, western part of Bangladesh. And uh, Professor Yunus did, uh, he is in the southeastern part, uh, almost diagonally the opposite part of, of Bangladesh. And of course, uh, uh, since then, uh, it has grown. Uh, so he was not really this kind of otherworldly person, uh, 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 the typical representation that you find of uh, gurus uh, and other people uh, who come from the mysterious East uh, and then mystify uh, the so-called West. Uh, I remember uh, uh, from an old hymn uh, uh, in a church I once went to, uh, uh, it went something like, in Christ there is neither East nor West. Uh, which I think actually captures a very deep truth. After all, uh, the world is round. Uh, what is east and what is west? Uh, uh, we create these categories um, in our minds, and sometimes they become culturally fixed, uh, and that creates a lot of difficulties in um, uh, com communicating across geographical um, and other barriers. Uh, uh, these need not be real barriers uh, if the spirit is there. I think that is uh, uh, the simplest way uh, I can... I can put this. Um, and Tagore had this spirit uh, uh, because of the kind of family he came from. Uh, his father uh, was a mystic um, and uh, was uh, widely read uh, both in the mystical literature of the um, uh, European uh, variety as well as of uh, the Middle East, uh, um, especially Iranian Sufi literature, as well as uh, the domestic uh, Hindu and Buddhist uh, literature. Um, uh, every culture I know of actually has a deep spiritual tradition. Uh, I think it is only human you know, to, to, to have a spirit and to, to want to uh, uh, develop uh, that spirit. Uh, uh, words do get in the, in the way of, uh, of expressing these things because ultimately uh, the deepest mystical experience is ineffable. Uh, you really cannot express this in words. You can point to it of course, but you cannot really express it uh, uh, in words. Um, it's not propositional, certainly. Poetry and music are probably the closest uh, uh, towards that, uh, and there may be some mystical paintings. Uh, uh, in fact, it is hard to explain all the efforts that went into uh, um, uh, European uh, Middle Ages uh, uh, in creating religious art uh, uh, without uh, uh, thinking that there must have been something that really moved these people very, very deeply. And uh, uh, for those who actually uh, uh, know about art, um, uh, uh, or even without knowing, uh, you sometimes feel that some are genuinely expressions of uh, uh, spiritual uh, experience and others are just uh, reproductions uh, for business purposes. Uh, Italians were very good at that, as you know. Uh, <laughs> they were good at actually exporting music, too. Uh, to the rest of the of Europe at, at one point. Anyway. So, uh, uh, Tagore uh, uh, pretty much breathed this uh, um, uh, spirituality 
naturally and he connected very easily uh, nature with, uh, with spirituality and, uh, and love, human love, uh, with spirituality. So those things uh, uh, made it much easier for him, I think, to uh, grow and develop. Uh, but uh, he did go through several stages. Um, at the beginning, uh, his father, who was um, quite organized and, and demanding, uh, would hold these regular uh, musical or worship sessions, as it were, uh, in their household. And uh, um, uh, he would ask um, his sons, he had quite a few sons, <laughs> uh, and sometimes his daughters too, uh, to, to compose, uh, uh, to write and compose. So, so initially, uh, uh, the easy thing to do uh, was to take some model that existed in um, uh, the literature already in, in uh, classical or semi-classical music. Uh, and uh, uh, he never learned music systematically, but he was exposed to a lot of classical, uh, North Indian classical, and later South Indian classical and uh, European um, classical, as well as uh, 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 church uh, music. So uh, uh, his initial attempts are basically to take uh, some Indian raga, and I, uh, this, this course is on Indian music, right? Or, or is yeah. it? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's called uh, Music, Dance, and Everyday Life in South Asia. Oh, okay, so okay, that's good. Okay, that's, that's good. But uh, do you all know what, what a rag or raga is? You know, okay. Basically, we haven't okay. delved in yet. Rajiv Tarnath will be here. Okay, okay, time, okay. So that, that okay. Time okay. Okay. okay, so just to uh, 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 give you some very basic idea that uh, it is usually a few, few notes, uh, could be four or more. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there's a fair, fairly definite structure of those notes, uh, the ascending and descending structures. Uh, and then uh, within that, uh, there are certain notes that play uh, uh, important roles. Uh, so I guess in, in abstract form, that's probably as much as, as, as one can say. Uh, but you know, for example, that the, the major scale, right, uh, which is uh, one particular rag in, 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 in Indian music, it's called rag vilava. Uh, and it's Bilawal, B-I-L-A-W-A-L, -B Bilawal. Uh, and uh, so uh, do they know the basic scale of the music? Uh, for like Hindustani music? Hindustani music. We haven't done something. Like okay, so uh, uh, maybe I'll just get, get them started. So <laughs> this <laughs> so uh, if you start, you can start from any any pitch that you're that you comfortable with. Okay. So Sai is the, is the first thing. Sa re ga ma pa dha ni sa. So that's the major scale, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So <laughs> and then you can descend, and 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 that will be one ra, bilawal. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, we know that in the chromatic scale we have twelve notes, right? Uh, in the piano, right? <laughs> 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 you can go check there. Uh, okay. We have we have seven seven white and and, and five black keys uh, uh, in the chromatic scale. So we have uh, uh, those half steps also. Uh, and in uh, North Indian music, uh, in addition to those half steps, you have some things in between. So <laughs> we'll try to listen to a, a few excerpts of, of that sort. Uh, that in between stuff is very, very important. Um, uh, uh, these, you can call them microtones. Uh, there is a Sanskrit word for that called shruti, which is S-H-R-U-T-I, shruti. Uh, so these uh, these microtones are uh, also very important in uh, in Ran. Um, so when I uh, show you some examples of Tagore's music, uh, uh, maybe we will uh, be able to see that. Uh, there is one uh, uh, particular uh, 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 rag called Kafi, uh, and Kafi has. Um, uh, 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 Gandhar, which is abbreviated as Ga, uh, which is the third note in the scale, uh, that is flattened, and then uh, uh, Nishad, which is the seventh seventh note before you go up uh, another octave, uh, that also is flattened. Uh, and uh, uh, in every rag, as I, as I said, you have some uh, uh, some something kind of a handle to <laughs> to kick help you with, uh, with uh, catching up. And this is called pakar, which literally means to catch, right? <laughs> or, or something to be caught. 
And in, in, in Kafi, it is quite uh, simple. It is, um, uh, you start with the first one. Sa, sa, re, re, ga, ga, ma, ma, pa. So you uh, uh, end with the fifth one. So this uh, song that I'm going to play for, for you, I'll ask Saraji to play for you. Um, let me make sure. Uh, Number 16. Okay. And uh, while she's setting it up, I let me uh, tell you a little bit. Uh, it's actually it comes from an original Hindi uh, song. Uh, he just took the structure, the melodic structure, from that song. So this is from his early period. Uh, uh, but he put actually words that are from his heart. Uh, he's talking about uh, going around empty-handed and. Uh, 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 he feels like uh, he does not have any anything to give, um, so he is truly poor, <laughs> poor in spirit. That is, uh, uh, and he is expressing this sense of being lost and being poor and being empty, uh, and uh, uh, then uh, really asking for some way to to go forward. And uh, so it's it's really a, a very heartfelt. Uh, cry of hopelessness and helplessness and yet a kind of uh, faint faith you might say <laughs> that maybe something will happen uh, if nothing else then just through the act of writing and, and, and singing and composing something will happen let me see if you have any, any questions about uh, rags or this kind of music how much have you heard of uh, Indian music? Well, lots in class. I didn't know anything class. about it prior to coming into okay. class. But. Vocal or instrumental or both? Yeah, both. Um, both, okay. okay. We haven't spent too much time with um, classical music, mm -hmm. as I've mentioned. Mm -hmm. What kinds of genres have you listened to and learned about so far? Kabali, uh -huh. yeah, Kabali is great. Bhangra, um, yeah. <laughs> you can dance to Bhangra. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. Anything else? Ghazal? Ghazal yeah. also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I have some ghazals there too. Okay. Uh, uh, so, at least we know it. So, I think I said number 16, didn't I? Yes. Okay. Shall we start? Yeah. Let's start. And the, and the, uh, let me find the, uh, I think the uh, tal, the rhythm, rhythmic structure, uh, it's very interesting. It's actually called shurfakta, which is a 10-bit uh, tal uh, um, and uh, divided into three parts. Uh, um, so it goes like four, two, four. Uh, but anyway, that's, that, you know, uh, that's not most important, but uh, you can see that initially he was fairly traditional. You know, he would follow the rag and the tal uh, quite uh, uh, closely without challenging or questioning those things, uh, which you would do later in his life. So this is uh, Rabindra Shandhi. Rabindra Shandhi, that's right. Yeah. Music composed by Rabindra uh, This one? Okay, uh, you, you may not know the uh, uh, words, but the language, it is actually in Bengali. Yeah, you can look. Pass it around. And who's performing? Uh, actually, I'm performing. That's what I <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, we don't have a tabla player here, so I thought it would be better just to bring.
the song goes on. It has uh, Antigor uh, in uh, in Kali. Actually, you can see see it uh, in, in in some Kali's. Uh, it's usually kind of a two-part form, A, B, and then you go back to A. So what I just uh, sang there for you, uh, it was A, B, A. Uh, but there is also another part, uh, uh, C, and a fourth part, D. Uh, this this particular form is called Dhrupad, uh, D-H-R-A-P-A-D, D-H-R-A-P-A-D, uh, Dhrupad form. Um, and uh, uh, you have uh, also another uh, form that uh, uh, that is uh, uh, Khayal, uh, khayal literally means imagination. Uh, it was developed later. Uh, khayal is K H A Y A L, uh, and that has only two parts. So that's really a two-part form. Uh, the first part is called Stai. Uh, you don't have to write that down. And the second part is called Antra. Um, uh, and uh, then you do a lot of embellishment and improvisation. Uh, if we have time, I'll play you one one khayal. Uh, short khayal uh, uh, and then uh, you'll see the difference uh, but uh, 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 that particular longing that uh, that I'm talking about uh, were you able to feel some of that in, in, in the singing of course part of it uh, uh, how you sing also if you, if you yourself do not feel when you're singing <laughs> nothing of that will come uh, uh, but I think in spite of, of uh, cultural differences uh, uh, you can feel when there is some genuine longing in someone, whether it is for something of this world, <laughs> if somebody is in love and cannot, you know, find the beloved, um, uh, 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 that uh, is the kind of longing that is fairly universal. And longing for uh, finding your deeper self, uh, uh, which is one way of defining God. Uh, um, uh, theologians, of course, dispute these things all the time. and. Uh, for for people who are mystics or, or people who are both mystics and, and, and artists, uh, uh, those intellectual disputes really do not matter very much. Uh, what matters is whether you feel that in your heart. And uh, for art, of course, what matters further is if you really can express it uh, in a form that is adequate uh, to that feeling. Uh, so that's uh, um, uh, another song from uh, this period. Uh, which is uh, uh, about uh, the evening slowly descending. Uh, uh, I think any, anybody who really um, uh, loves uh, uh, nature and uh, who is uh, uh, really sensitive to, 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 to the change of uh, uh, the day and change of mood uh, that comes with uh, uh, the change of days, uh, must feel this, that when evening comes, right, uh, most people may not be able to get up that early in the, uh, 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 as students, unless there are early morning classes, <laughs> but, but most people don't go to sleep, you know, uh, uh, before evening. Uh, so evening, uh, evening mood is very, very interesting, I think, uh, because uh, something is ending, and in a more rural setting, um, and uh, does anybody come from village here? No, we are all very urban. You, you do. Small town, okay. So you can see that uh, there is more of a natural rhythm in the life of a small town and certainly in a village, uh, which is also tied to seasons. I spent about two months in villages in Bangladesh doing field work, singing, and, <laughs> and uh, had a wonderful time. Uh, and uh, that natural cycle is very much there uh, in the villages. So the day is ending, you're slowing down, um, or you feel that you should slow down, uh, but it's not quite time to go to bed yet, uh, and you feel kind of um, uh, a sense of otherworldliness, that, uh, that there is something more in this world that you see, that you live in, that you touch and feel uh, uh, every day, that seems so mundane, right? Uh, there is something deeper, something more beautiful, uh, something uh, more calm uh, and peaceful. Uh, this particular song that he wrote, uh, uh, it's also uh, uh, in, a, in a rag, it's called Purbi, Rat Purbi. And Rat Purbi is interesting because it has both uh, uh, the 
cobalt recap, which is the second uh, note flattened. By the way, there is a theory of this, uh, uh, these flat notes and, and sharp notes. Uh, the fourth note is sharpened. Uh, the idea is that uh, uh, in the morning and in the evening, when um, first you are waking up, and there is this kind of indistinct gradual blending uh, of the light uh, and of your um, uh, awareness. You know, first when you wake up from bed, at least, you know, uh, uh, sometimes I feel that way, that I really wished I could have slept a little more. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but there is that kind of sense uh, of uh, not wanting to wake up and yet uh, waking up. And uh, in the evening, it's, uh, uh, as I said, uh, 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 slowing down uh, and light is gradually fading and blending. Uh, so people who are visual artists also uh, are uh, very able, very much able to feel these things. Uh, and musicians uh, in uh, India especially became uh, extra sensitive to these things for some reason, I don't really know. Uh, but uh, to my knowledge uh, of all the uh, musical traditions that I have been exposed to, that tradition seems to have paid more attention to it. But you can find it in, in, in Western music too. Uh, so this is uh, on, uh, this is my number 19. And uh, uh, so the idea is, is to, uh, here the mood is much more upbeat. He has finally developed uh, uh, in spirit a little bit and he's not quite as lonely and, and quite as full of longing and the sense that he has nothing. Um, he is actually feeling that uh, gradually his soul is, 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 is filling up uh, during this hour and that he is at peace with himself. That, um, oh, the rhythm of this is also interesting. It is 3-2-2 two, two rhythm. India, Indian music has a lot of interesting rhythms that you find in Western music only in the 20th century, especially with Stravinsky. Uh, there are Stravinsky fans. I'm a great Stravinsky fan. Uh, I think he is just wonderful, especially in rhythms. Uh, but this is uh, one of those interesting odd-numbered odd rhythms. Tokyo. <laughs> Musical instrument is called Israj. Recording. <laughs> okay, uh, but you can sense that here uh, uh, he is much, uh, uh, much more at peace with himself, and uh, 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 and then he actually forgets about the rags, and uh, uh, later he would forget about the rhythms as well, and he gives the music that comes from within himself the free play. Uh, so the next one that uh, 
this is number uh, four. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, he is actually now amazed. Uh, uh, I think anybody who, who really um, uh, has deep mystical uh, experience uh, uh, feels at least two things. One is that you feel at one with everything, uh, uh, that you are not really separate from the rest of the universe. Uh, uh, and this is something, again, uh, that has to be experienced yeah, because no matter how many times somebody tells you <laughs> that this is what you feel <laughs> unless you yourself feel it uh, there is no way to really convey that feeling of, of what it is like uh, secondly uh, you every time you you look at the creation you are uh, you are full of this uh, uh, wonder really uh, you become like a child I think that is uh, one one thing that is really great about mystical experience is that uh, um, you can be a child again and again and again, you know, with the same innocence and wonder. Uh, and uh, in this particular uh, song, uh, this also is, uh, uh, he has forgotten Rag, but he hasn't forgotten Tal. <laughs> it has, uh, it, it also is uh, this uh, same Tal, uh, it's called Teora or Dupak, uh, uh, has, uh, there are some differences between these two, but uh, basic structure is the same, 3, 2, 2. Um, uh, and uh, then, uh, this uh, uh, he is looking at the sky at night and stars and he is um, uh, asking rhetorically uh, to the creator uh, how do you play this fiery vina vina is an, is an Indian instrument you may have seen a picture it's a string instrument uh, so he's saying uh, oh my lord how do you play you know this this fiery instrument that um, uh, I, I can only see and uh, uh, I know that uh, uh, in my own life you have done the same thing, that I am nothing but like a small instrument that you play. And you play and you create this feeling of sadness and also of joy. And most of all, you just give me a little bit of that divine spark of creation. The same, same spirit of creation that uh, uh, I see looking up. I also feel inside myself and I know where it comes from. So this actually is a further stage I think in, in, in his development. Uh, so that's the song. We go to C part, which is a different uh, melodic structure, and then B part will have the same structure as the D part. Peace. 
one complete song and uh, uh, the next one is a short one it's uh, yeah, it injects a little bit of humor uh, if you understand Bengali um, uh, he never wants to forget uh, his own smallness at least in in, 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 the, in existence in human form uh, Tagore talks about two eyes uh, I, um, I meaning you know myself um, uh, there is a small I and there is, is a uh, great greater I. So the small I is what we might in, in just uh, ordinary language what we uh, talk about when we say the word ego, right? Uh, we don't really like people who are egoistic or egotistic especially, we talk a lot about themselves. Um, uh, uh, it's a sign of smallness um, uh, and uh, in every mystical tradition you find that idea uh, that ego is, is, is a very small thing uh, that perhaps we cannot do without it you know when we are in human form uh, but it is not the greatest of things to be um, and then there is a uh, larger I, a greater I and that I actually is um, uh, in a sense the universal spirit uh, that is the part that can connect uh, um, uh, during mystical experience with everything and we each one of us uh, according to the mystics really has this potential we have this spirit but most of the times it is hidden and we don't even look for it and one of the problems uh, uh, that Tagore found and I find also I, I have to confess with uh, modernity and modern life is that uh, uh, it is too hectic uh, it is it is too uh, busy um, uh, and it is too proud, you might say, you know, pride of science, of technology, of uh, power, of wealth, um, all kinds of things that uh, if you go back and actually read some of the sermons of, of um, uh, Puritans uh, in New England I, uh, and uh, Pennsylvania and those places, uh, Pennsylvania, the Quakers especially, uh, you find that uh, Americans of that time were very different actually. They, are very, they were very different in spirit from the Americans of today. Uh, not all of them of course. I mean, there's, you know, and, and there is the other great tradition in this country, the, uh, the spirituality that developed uh, uh, under great suffering uh, uh, in the plantations um, among the African American people uh, and which are expressed in the great uh, spiritual songs. Uh, uh, which I love. Um, uh, there is a gentleman in uh, Women's College, uh, Arthur Jones, a uh, good friend of mine. Yeah, he, I, I had him in my class actually last spring and uh, we talked and we sang actually some of these spirituals together and that was a wonderful experience. Uh, so it is, it is here also if we only just look for it you know, historically as well as uh, today uh, and there are people who are celebrating uh, that, that greater I or that is when we connect with one another. So uh, uh, he is saying here that I am writing all these songs and and I'm composing and I am, but I am always afraid that perhaps I will forget my own melodies. Uh, and actually, he used to because he he did not um, uh, write them down in notation. He would have to go to other people to to help him. Um, uh, and uh, but he was a very good singer. Uh, he had a great voice uh, when he was young. Uh, we are told. Um, unfortunately, there are no recordings except from his very old age when his voice was kind of shaky. But, but still, he had a very musical uh, voice. Uh, uh, I think it must be in his 70s. Uh, uh, I have to. So uh, here uh, he is saying that perhaps you know I will I will um, uh, forget my own melody. Perhaps uh, uh, the string will break. You know <laughs> from, from from the from the vina. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, 
the time for celebration uh, will have passed uh, and I will be just sitting there <laughs> without my son. Uh, and uh, uh, so he, uh, uh, it's a very short song actually, so that's why I, I want to uh, play it also. also uh, it's, a, it's, it's a much faster tempo and it is a, uh, there is a uh, rhythm, uh, rhythmic structure called kaharba, uh, which can be in four beats or, or eight beats. Uh, uh, so four beats are, uh, would be very familiar, right, because a lot of Western music is also four, four time, although there are many intricacies in Western music too, rhythmically. Um, uh, and this one is in eight beat karba, uh, but uh, it's fairly fast, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, it's easy to to track. But uh, uh, so he's talking about this thing, which is very, in a way, uh, uh, humorous, uh, uh, and he's also afraid that uh, 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 during that uh, scene of destruction, you know, um, uh, in in Indian mythology, you have the uh, uh, great figure of Shiva, uh, who is uh, the lord of music uh, and dance uh, and creation and destruction. So uh, he creates and he destroys and he dances through it all. And there is this uh, uh, dance of destruction, uh, it's called Tandava in Sanskrit, this, this Tandava Nritya, which is the dance of destruction. He says, uh, uh, well, if you call me, you know, during this uh, uh, time of destruction and uh, if my rhythm does not, you know, uh, uh, fit that rhythm, if if if, if they are not uh, uh, in 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 rhythm, in step, uh, in that great storm, uh, when death comes and uh, wants to greet me, uh, I am afraid that uh, uh, I will be without a song, and that time of great party will also be lost. <coughs> So he's always full of all kinds of questions. Uh, spirituality is not something that you find once and for all and, and that stays with you. I think a lot of people have this illusion um, uh, who think that they are taking the spiritual path that somehow at some point on a certain you know, hour or minute or second you know, something will happen magically and then you know, everything will be just fine. It's not like that. Smooth sailing from there. <laughs> That's on. right. It's not such a smooth sailing. In fact, uh, the spiritual path is full of confusion and doubt and uh, uh, pain also, <laughs> but also also tremendous joy. So uh, one who has taken that chance, uh, as he says in his late points that I put in uh, during that talk, um, uh, you'll recall, uh, that person actually also finds that, that ultimate joy, the ultimate bliss. Okay, so uh, with those words of introduction, this uh, th th is the track five, yeah, next one. It's only minute and a half. So he is still full of doubt, but uh, he has uh, also glimpsed, I think, uh, the eternal in, in the temporal. And uh, uh, so he, he has achieved something, but not permanently. That is what uh, I think he is trying to tell us. Uh, now, I told you that uh, uh, he uh, didn't really forsake Rag, and there is a very deep song that he wrote uh, towards the end of his life. 
which is a combination of uh, several rags, um, uh, which is in people who will go by strict musical grammar would never do. And so he has uh, uh, combined uh, uh, rag Bahar, which is a uh, song about the spring with uh, a rag called Shahana, and also uh, a third rag yet. Uh, uh, well, I can't play all of them for you, but I'll play a little bit of Bahar and then I will play um, uh, that song. Uh, and I, let me find where that Bahar is. Yeah, it's in this one. And in uh, this is uh, uh, in Khayal form. In Khayal form, you have uh, 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 this Thai part, uh, one short part, uh, and then Antra, which is the higher in, in higher register. And uh, uh, then uh, you you start with something called Alap, which is not in Thal. Um, I, I only did a very short Alap in this one because it says short Khayal. When short Khayal is more than ten minutes long. Um, uh, and then uh, you, 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 you do in uh, alap also in tal, and then you do what is called tan. And tan is when you sing the notes very quickly. And you have, the, um, uh, there are lots of technical things that, uh, that happen, uh, which uh, is not important for us, and we are not going to go that far in this one. Although if you are interested, I can give you the CD and you can listen to it. So we'll just uh, follow the short alap and then sthai and antra and then we'll uh, uh, listen to that song by Jigo.
that's the both the parts and then you are back to one uh, sky and then you have to do some halal in Kal. This is by the way called Pintal, 16 weeks. Um, you, uh, most of the classical music uh, in the first part uh, is in Pintal. Uh, but sometimes you use Kaptal, these 10 weeks. Um, and uh, the slow part, there is also a slow part, very, very slow. <laughs> Vilambit, it's called, literally means slow. Uh, and that part is in, 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 in something called Ektal. Is, which really has 12 weeks, but it's stretched out so far that it seems like, you know, 48 or <laughs> more. Yes. Those are tablas? Yeah, tablas, yeah. So, you know, tabla yeah. it has the two parts. The uh, left-handed part, uh, it can create all kinds of tones, uh, and the right-handed part gives you a more sharp uh, uh, beat, but also can create different kinds of tones depending on where you hit it. So tabla is a very difficult instrument to play, uh, very, very difficult. Uh, okay, so this, uh, uh, what I wanted to uh, uh, show you here is, uh, well, here's, here is one rug, uh, the structure of that is very clear. Um, and uh, you can take the time to uh, expand and contract and show all kinds of uh, relationship between uh, different melodic structures and, and, and substructures. Usually in the spring, uh, spring is the time when I think uh, in every culture I know, uh, people uh, feel quite romantic. Uh, uh, in, in Bengal, in addition to the spring, rainy season is also supposed to be romantic. Uh, and that's something different, I think, from uh, some other cultures. I think Japan is like that. Uh, I don't know so much about China. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, certainly spring seems to be By the way, he wrote uh, throughout his entire life more than 2,000 songs, um, and uh, uh, very few of them actually repeat uh, um, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, the same thematic material. Uh, so he really had this amazing capacity, uh, musical capacity, to, to, to create, uh, quite apart from his <laughs> uh, ability as a poet. Uh, um, and uh, uh, so uh, he... Uh, starts his lyric by uh, uh, declaring that that night when, you know, that very, very uh, stormy night of, uh, uh, of despair, uh, when uh, the house where I was living actually uh, itself <laughs> was broken, <laughs> uh, it was literally the door was sound and, that and, and, and you know you can almost talk like a uh, ghost story uh, but uh, but in much more serious tone of course and then uh, uh, he says that everything became dark and uh, uh, all light went out um, and I did not know what it all meant <coughs> And then when I wake up in the morning, so I, and that you are still there in the emptiness that remains. In the emptiness that remains. So ultimately, uh, there is that paradox in Zen Buddhism, that sometimes expressed as the fullness of emptiness, uh, that uh, our words really can only go so far without running into paradoxes. One way to express genuine spiritual experience is to use paradox, uh, which you know, things just don't make sense. Not 